Well, good morning to all of you. Let me see if I can get this turned on here. Here we go. Testing, one, two, three, four. <laughs> testing, testing, testing. Hello, hello. Is it on? No. Try it the other way. Hello? Testing, testing. There we go. There we go. <laughs> well, good morning to all of you. I greet you in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope. And I uh, want to thank uh, Corey and her team for the wonderful leadership and worship this weekend. It's been so great. You know, I told the crowd yesterday that she's going to be pretty good one of these days if she can ever develop any passion. That's it. <laughs> it's just, uh, anyway, uh, I uh, also want to thank the tech team for all the work they've done to make all these instruments work. And, yeah. and I've told your pastor, I, I was here last year and as, a, as an observer, and I told him then, I have never been to a church in my life where they had such a dedicated staff who looked after every detail and things were so beautifully organized. It's just unbelievable uh, what's going on here. But praise the Lord for them. And I also want to strongly endorse Olivier Milnick's ministry. I hope you will go home, that you will uh, find uh, his ministry on the website, and that you will make a donation. And I don't ask you to do something I haven't done. The moment I learned that he had decided to establish a ministry, I made a donation immediately. And I hope you will do that because uh, for over 40 years, almost 45 years ago, I did that. In 1980, I had been a university professor for uh, 20 years, and I stepped out in faith, and I mean, it was a scary step, and uh, the Lord encouraged me in many ways, but uh, I had to learn to walk by faith, and that was a difficult uh, task to learn how to do, but I learned how to trust in the Lord and walk by faith, and I know that uh, when you take that step, it is a, a momentous one, and I hope you will help him by encouraging him, writing him, write him a note, encourage him, and send him a donation. Please do that. Well, I uh, established Lamb and Lion Ministry in 1980. I headed up that ministry for 41 years, and in June of 2021, I retired after 41 years. And uh, my successor, Tim Moore, took over, and I moved my office to my home. And I have been doing one thing ever since I've been concentrating on writing books. And I've written five so far. Uh, four have been published. The fifth one is yet to be published. It'll be called How to Die with a Smile on Your Face. And I'm, anxious, I'm hoping that's going to be out next month. Uh, but that, that's something that a Christian can do because they know the moment that they take that last breath, they're going to be in the presence of Almighty God. Today I have a very heavy topic to discuss with you, and that's America's destiny. I want to show you uh, some church signs that relate to the topic. And these are very serious church signs. For example, moral confusion, sexual confusion, gender confusion, author of confusion, Satan. How about this one? This one is very insightful. Gradually, the unthinkable becomes tolerable, then acceptable, then legal, then praised. And that's exactly where we are in America today. We are praising the unthinkable. So let's go on here. This is a church that's decided they're not going to get in bed with the world. Abortion is murder. Sodomy is abominable. God is the same. America is in trouble. Or this one, if you want God to bless America, stop legalizing sin. Yeah. And finally, the one in Bible prophecy, the newest one that I just got, and that is this one. Normal is not coming back, Jesus is. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> well, my topic is American's destiny. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus and just thank you so much for the many ways you've already blessed us this morning, Lord, in fellowship and in worship. Uh, we just thank you. And we thank you for this church. And for the fact that it is a church that's not willing to get in, to, uh, in bed with the world, we thank you for Andy. We thank you that he's a man who stands on your word and preaches your word without uh, uh, any compromise whatsoever. And I pray that the people of this congregation will stand behind him and encourage him and pray for him. And that this church will continue to have a tremendous impact upon this community, this state, and around the world. Be with us now as we look into this difficult topic. I pray that you will 
Guide my thoughts, my words. I pray that uh, you'll guide even the inflection of my voice. Use me as an empty vessel for you to work through to touch the hearts for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, because of the nature of my topic, and because I'm going to be touching on very sensitive issues, I want to begin with two disclaimers. First of all, I am not a Republican, nor am I a Democrat. I am a monarchist. And I say that because I have devoted my entire life to do everything I can to prepare the way for the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Amen. He is going to reign with a rod of iron from Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and He's going to bring peace, righteousness, and justice to this very troubled earth. Here's the way social commentator Tom Starnes put it recently. He said, we don't need more Americans bowing down to the Democrat donkey or the Republican elephant. We need more Americans bowing down to the Lion of Judah. Amen. So, I don't think we're going to find our hope in the, in the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. We're not going to find a hope for America there. Rather, I believe that Jesus is our only hope and therefore, therefore, I am sorry to say that I believe this nation has very little hope because we have turned our back on God. Throughout American history, there have been, uh, and today, today there are very well-meaning pastors who are preaching that a great spiritual revival is about to come to America. They point to such revivals in the past when our nation has grown cold in the Lord. And there have been many such revivals. But the situation today is totally different. We have not grown cold in the Lord. We are a nation in outright rebellion against God, shaking our fist at God every day. And every day I say to my wife, it couldn't get any worse, and the next day it gets worse. We are in a downward spiral that is unbelievable. Uh, I don't think the revival is on the, on the uh, uh, horizon. Here is an example of the kind of rebellion. In uh, the year of 2012, when the horrible Connecticut school shooting took place, this t-shirt came out. Dear God, why do you allow so much violence in our schools? Signed a concerned student. Dear concerned student, I'm not allowed in school. Sign God. <laughs> Pretty good answer. Well, I would like to begin with three foundational scriptures. First, Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh. Second one, Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. The third one, Proverbs 28, 2, when there is moral rot within a nation, its government topples easily. In 2003, a book of mine was published entitled, America the Beautiful? The subtitle was The United States in Bible Prophecy. The third edition was published in 2009, and it was titled, American Suicide, rather, same title, America the Beautiful. I have since replaced these books by a new one called America's Suicide. I'm sorry we don't have any copies left, but you can find those on our website at lamblion.com. This particular book begins by outlining seven principles that the Bible reveals about how God relates to nations. And in the book I go into each one of these in detail and provide all the Scripture references for each principle. But I have time to talk about only one in this presentation. And that is this one, that God destroys a nation that He has blessed when its rebellion becomes entrenched, reaching a point of no return. We'll read that again. God destroys a nation He has blessed when its rebellion becomes entrenched, reach, reaching a point of no return. And that is just as true as it can be, and you can find it all through the Bible. Well, let's take a look, look at it in a little bit greater detail. How does God deal with a rebellious nation He has blessed? The first thing He does is He raises up always prophetic voices to call the nation to repentance. He does that because He never pours out His wrath without warning. So He will raise up prophetic voices and they will start calling the nation to repentance over and over. They will warn of His impending wrath. Secondly, He will put upon the nation remedial judgments. If they do not respond to the prophetic warnings, the remedial judgments will come. A remedial judgment is one that is for the purpose of calling people to repentance. If you look at Deuteronomy 28 you will see a long, long list of remedial judgments as long as your arm. They include such things as uh, economic calamities, rebellious youth, uh, 
epidemics of divorce, rampant disease, defeat and war, crop failures, political confusion, natural disasters, and giving a nation the kind of leaders it deserves. That is an ominous thing. And then, if the nation ignores the prophetic voices, if the nation ignores the remedial judgment, then destruction will come. He will deliver the nation from judgment to destruction. The Bible has this uh, uh, chilling real revelation about this. Namely, the Bible clearly teaches, I mean clearly, that there is a point of no return for a nation that God has blessed that's in rebellion against Him. That, that point is, uh, is stated over and over in the Scriptures. You can look it up sometime. It's over and over. And that is this, when the wound becomes incurable. When the wound becomes incurable. So, for example, many years after Jonah, God raised up another prophet to send to Nineveh, a prophet by the name of Nahum. And this time Nahum was told that Nineveh had an incurable wound. And sure enough, there was no repentance and the nation was destroyed. Later on, the prophet Jeremiah was told to use the same terminology concerning Judah. He said, tell the people of Judah that they have reached the point of no return. Tell them that the wound has become incurable. And Jeremiah was even told to stop praying for his nation. So I don't want you praying for them anymore because they've reached the point of no return. And Ezekiel was told the same thing, only he was told it in stronger terms. Ezekiel was told that if the most righteous men who have ever lived, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were to intervene for Judah, it would be of no avail except for themselves and their families, because the nation had reached the point of no return and was going to be destroyed. My friends, God is patient. He is long-suffering, but He cannot be mocked. He will deal with sin. Consider these words from Nahum chapter 1. A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger, great in power, and Yahweh will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Now, let's quickly apply these principles to the United States. I believe that God raised up this nation for a very specific reason. I believe He raised it up with the purpose of using our great natural resources and our technical ingenuity to spread the gospel all over the world, which we proceeded to do. As we fulfilled His purpose, we poured out, He poured out blessings upon us, blessings like unparalleled freedom, prosperity, immense power, worldwide influence. He even gave us the blessing of serving as the key nation in the rebirthing and the nurturing of the nation of Israel. What a wonderful blessing. But the problem is, we became enamored with our wealth and with our power in the last half of the 20th century, and we began turning our back on God. And the evidence is everywhere you look. Money became our God, greed became our national motivator, sex became our obsession, gambling became our national pastime, we became the world's largest consumer of illegal drugs, we kicked God out of our schools, we converted our educational system into a vehicle of indoctrination, we committed the insanity of confusing our children's gender identity, we are teaching our children the fantasy of evolution, we have declared God off limits in the public arena, we are continuing to slaughter babies in the name of freedom of choice for women, we we have glamorized homosexuality. We have legalized same-sex marriage. Many states have legalized marijuana, and some have legalized all hard drugs. And we have become the moral polluter of planet Earth with our violent, immoral, and blasphemous movies and television programs. As we have wallowed in the sexual revolution of the 1960s, God began to raise up prophetic voices like Dave Wilkerson, who began calling this nation to repentance. That was in the mid-1970s when he did that. When we refused to repent, the remedial judgments began to fall. I believe that some of the main remedial judgments we have experienced in recent years, and these are only a few, would be the Vietnam War, which, which occurred on the heels of the sexual revolution of the 1960s, the 9-11 attacks of 2001. I don't know if you ever thought about those attacks. God allowed the terrorists to attack the two symbols of American pride. The towers in New York, pride in our wealth, and the Pentagon, pride in our power. That was no accident. God was telling us a message about our pride. Hurricane Katrina in 2005, undoubtedly God's response to our immorality and our forcing Israel to abandon the Gaza Strip. 
It was the Bush administration that forced them to abandon the Gaza Strip and turn it over to terrorists. The storm formed suddenly in the Gulf of Mexico. It was not one of those storms that came across the Atlantic. It just suddenly formed in the Gulf of Mexico. And on the last day, it formed on, it hit on the last day of the Gaza Strip withdrawal and hit New Orleans just as it was about to begin its annual homosexual festival. I don't think those were coincidence. I think they were God incidences. The September 2008 stock market crash, again a response to our attempts to strong arm Israel into surrendering its heartland occurred on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and the market fell by 777 points as if God had signed the uh, fall of the stock market. And then the type of leaders we deserve. It is no accident that President Obama was the most pro-abortion, pro-homosexual, anti-capitalist, anti-Israel leader in the entire history of our nation to that point, nor is it any accident that Biden was elected and was picked up has picked up where Obama left off. A final remedial judgment that I would mention is another one which, like the election of depraved leaders, is one that we have brought upon ourselves. It is the out-of-control, greedy, immoral spending. What our nation has done is equivalent to my purchasing a $300 million mansion on a 200-year mortgage. I may enjoy it now, but I'm going to leave it for my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren to pay for our nation is on the biggest spending spree in the history of mankind and is leading to the greatest economic collapse in history. Look at this chart. Or rather, I'll get to it here in a moment. Here we go. Look at this chart. The U.S. national debt. The chart shows the growth of the U.S. national debt from 1940 to 2020. From 1940 to 2020. In 1940 it was $43 billion. By 2020, it had reached $23 trillion. Currently, and I mean currently, this morning, I looked it up. Currently, the debt has accelerated to $34.2 trillion, which is more than our nation's gross national pro domestic product. The total debt right now amounts to $101, almost $102,000 per person. I don't know about you, but I couldn't do that. And it, it also amounts to $265,000 per taxpayer. We are in a point where our economy is a house of cords that literally could collapse any moment. And God has sent warning after warning after warning, and we have simply ignored them. So, where is the United States in Bible prophecy? Andy said a few minutes ago he didn't think we are specifically there, and he is exactly right. We are not. But I believe we're there in a way. I think we're there in symbolic type, in prophetic type. I think that our type is the nation of Judah. I say that because of the parallels between Judah and the United States. The nation of Judah had great leaders just as we have had great leaders. They had freedom. They had prosperity. They had spiritual blessing. The Shekinah glory of God dwelt in their temple in Jerusalem. And we have had great spiritual blessings. I wish I could stop there, but I can't. I have to continue with the parallels and I'm not happy. Because what happened is because of all of these incredible blessings that God placed upon them, they suddenly became very prideful and began to think, well, we earned these things. We did this because we were so, uh, you know, full of wisdom and so forth instead of God supplying it. And so they became consumed in pride, and pride led to rebellion against God. You know the history of Judah, and you know how they ended up in rebellion against God. In Isaiah chapter 5, the prophet tells us about how God asked him to compile a list of the sins of Judah. And he compiled a list. Uh, God knew the sins of Judah. He wanted Isaiah to know. So Isaiah went out, he took a poll, he got, came back and he said, Lord, here are the sins of our nation. He said they are injustice, greed, pleasure seeking, blasphemy, moral perversion, intellectual pride, intemperance, and political corruption. Sounds like somebody just made a poll of the sins of America. The same sins here in the United States of America. Seventy-five years later, God called another prophet in Judah by the name of Jeremiah. And God asked him to do the same thing, to go out and do a poll of the sins of Judah. He came back with the same list, except he added one item, one item to the list. And that item was religious corruption. He talked about how prophets prophesy whatever people want them to prophesy if they'll give them a bribe. He talked about political corruption. And he concluded his report with three general observations. The three were these. Their faces were harder than a rock. They have a stubborn and rebellious heart. 
hearts full of rebellion, and they don't know how to blush. We've reached that point in America today. We don't have to blush. You know, my previous wife that I was married to for 60 years, she, she was a person who knew how to blush. She even blushed at television ads. When they would come, she said, I just can't even watch that. I just, I can't believe they've got that on there. Much less some of the programs, but the ads themselves caused her to blush. We watched them without any blushing at all. When Jeremiah went out and did what the Lord told him to do, when Jeremiah re- revealed the sins of the nation, when he called the nation to repentance, they did not repent. You know what they did? They began to chant, the tempo, the tempo, the tempo. What that mean? God's not going to allow anybody to touch Jerusalem or touch our temple. His Shekinah glory is in the temple. You're crazy, you prophet. He, he would never allow anybody to do that. Well, my friends, God allowed it. Likewise today God has sent us many different prophetic voices and remedial judgments and Americans including many professing Christians have responded to God's prophetic voices and His remedial judgments with disbelief that He would ever destroy our nation. I'm convinced that most Christians think God is sitting on the throne draped in an American flag. Well He's not folks, He's not. I'm convinced that before very long some tragic words applied to the, in the Bible to Judah will equally apply to our nation. You'll find these words in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and I'm going to read you two verses that are two of the saddest verses in the Bible. You can almost hear God weeping as I read them to you. It's after Judah was destroyed, and the prophet wrote this. He said, And Yahweh, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by His messengers, because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised His words, scoffed at His prophets, until the wrath of God rose against His people, until there was no remedy. This brings us to an important question. Why should the United States be treated any differently? The answer, of course, is that God is not treating us any differently. He has raised up prophetic voices to call us to repentance. He has sent remedial judgments. He has been so patient. And our response has been one of patriotism, when the needed response was repentance. After 9-11, my wife noticed an explosion of bumper stickers everywhere saying, God bless America. One day she turned to me and said, those bumper stickers are wrong. I said, what do you mean? She said, they're wrong. God has already blessed America. She said, I'm going to design one that's more appropriate. And here's the one she designed. America bless God. Not God bless America, but America bless God. The 9-11 attacks were a wake-up call to this nation, but instead of awakening us to repentance, we reacted like a sleepy man who hits the snooze button, rolls over, and goes back to sleep. And so our society has continued to slouch toward Gomorrah. Let me take a moment to emphasize to you how serious the decay of our nation has become. I think it's essential because I think we have become insensitive to it. Only a person my age, I'm 85, only a person my age can appreciate how radically and how quickly our society has disintegrated. I will begin by showing you a photo taken in New York City on the eve of Easter in 1956. You got that now? The eve of Easter, 1956. This is a photograph of New York City. At that very same time, In the mid-1950s, Congress added the words, One Nation Under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. At that very same time, in the mid-1950s, Congress adopted In God We Trust as our national motto. One Nation Under God, national motto. You know all three of those things. That picture and those laws, all three, are absolutely unthinkable today. In fact, there are numerous members of Congress who want to revoke the legislation, just as there are those who desire to replace our national anthem. Now, that's it. this is for real. They're wanting to replace the national anthem with John Lennon's song, Imagine, which is a praise of atheism. I was born in 1938 when autos still had running boards and when gasoline was 20 cents a gallon. When I was born, Abortionists were sent to prison. Pregnancy out of wedlock was thought of as scandalous. Homosexuality was considered unnatural, immoral, and sinful. 
Pornography was considered and despised as a perversion. Drugs were something you bought at a drugstore. Marriage was sacred. Living together was taboo. Divorce was a disgrace. Same-sex marriage was beyond the imagination of the wildest and most depraved person. There were only two genders, male and female, and people knew what a woman was. <laughs> Homemaking was honored. Daycare was provided by mothers in their homes. Child abuse was unheard of. Ladies did not smoke or curse. The word damn was considered flagrant language in a movie. In fact, the very first movie that ever had that word in it was Gone with the Wind. It ended with that word, and because of that, it was held up three months by the censors before they would allow it to be released. And yet, in 2013, a film called The Wolf of Wall Street, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, had the F word in it 544 times in 180 minutes. That's how far we've come in a very short period of time. When television began to spread nationwide in the 1950s, there were strict codes of conduct for the producers of television programs. Over the years since that time, these codes have ero eroded to the point that almost anything is allowed on TV today. The contrast is stunning. When I was growing up in the 1950s, we watched wholesome programs like The Life of Riley, I Love Lucy, Gunsmoke, Dragnet, Father Knows Best. All these programs taught basic Judeo-Christian moral principles. Today, the channels are flooded with morally depraved reality shows like Bachelorette, with demented dramatic series like Criminal Minds, with brutally lurid shows like Dexter, with sex-laden comedies like Two and a Half Men, with amoral programs like Breaking Bad, and with programs that are constantly pushing the homosexual agenda. Another societal problem is vulgarity, which has become commonplace. This uh, growing evil has even been recognized by the secular media. I want to show you something that's hard to believe. This is the cover of Time magazine in May of 1990, 30 years ago. Dirty words. The subtitle reads, America's foul mouth pop culture. That's 30 years ago. It's 100 times worse today. And that's secular media even talking about it. Back in the 1980s, the man who formed, uh, founded The Tonight Show, uh, Steve Allen, he lamented the growing depravity of American entertainment. Now this is 1980s. He observed, we have become a society where vulgarians entertain barbarians. Again, it's a hundred times worse today. The radical change in our society can perhaps be, best be illustrated by what has happened in our schools. I started the first grade in 1945 and completed high school in 1956, and during that time I was never exposed to any drug whatsoever, none. Today, kids are confronted with them at the elementary school level. When I was a kid, we began each day with a Bible reading and a prayer. We put on Easter pageants. We put on Christmas plays. When I graduated from high school in Waco in 1956, we had probably 200 pickup trucks on the parking lot, and every one of them had a gun rack, and on that gun rack was a 22, a deer rifle, all kinds of guns. They were, the parking lot was full of weapons, and nobody can, thought about that. Nobody was concerned about it because we had grown up with Judeo-Christian uh, principles. Today, we have moral pygmies holding guns of all kinds in our society willing to shoot each other over a pair of tennis shoes. The most dramatic way I can think of to illustrate how rapid the deterioration of our society has become in America is to consider a poll, a survey, concerning public school discipline problems. The survey was conducted in Fullerton, California, by the Fullerton, California Police Department in conjunction with the California Department of Education, statewide education poll in California. It was done in mid-1940s, 1945, right at the end of World War II, and the same poll was conducted 40 years later in 1984. When I show you this, you will want to weep. 1945, number one problem in school was talking, and I was one of those problems. <laughs> 1984, drug abuse. Chewing gum, alcohol abuse. Making noise, pregnancy. Running in the hallways, suicide. Getting out of turn in line, rape. 
wearing improper clothing, robbery, not putting paper in waste paper baskets, assault. Time Magazine, February the 1st, 1988. A few years ago, I heard a presentation by Jim Gorlow, former pastor of Skyline Wesleyan Church in La Mesa, California. He is considered to be one of Christendom's leading church historians. In his presentation, Pastor Gorlow presented a sweeping overview of the relationship between Bible-believing Christians and society. He started out by pointing out that from 1607 to 1833, a period of 236 years, Bible-believing Christians were the establishment of American society. I want you to watch how fast this goes down. 1833, 1918, we were the predominant force in American society for 85 years. 1918 to 1968, we a subdominant force. 1968, we became a subculture. 1988, a counterculture. 1998, an antithetical culture, which he defined as in full opposition to the predominant values of the society. And then it comes, 2008. Since that time, we are now a persecuted culture. A persecuted culture. One of the main reasons for this trend is because the number of Christians in our nations has plummeted. In 1956, back when you saw that picture of New York City, in 1956, 91% of Americans claimed to be Christians. Today, 61%. In 1956, 63% of Americans claim to go to church weekly. Today, 16%. 16%. It's amazing. And furthermore, polls show that 9% of Americans in general, 9% in general, claim to be Bible believers. Only 17% of professing Christians claim to be Bible believers. And the worst statistic that I've run across yet is one about the number of born-again Christians and their belief about Jesus. And I'll get to that in just a moment. What we've Also an example of the deterioration of American society is the war on Christians, the persecution of Christians. For example, in 2014, Todd Storns wrote this book, Godless America, Godless America. And in this book, he gave an example. He gave 89 absolutely horrendous examples of the persecution of Christians in this nation. In 2021, Congressman Greg Stubbe from, California, from Florida got up on the floor of Congress and he read a scripture and he, that, uh, to support his opposition to a piece of legislation that was endorsing transgenderism. As soon as he finished, Congressman Jerry Nadler of New York, the powerful chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, got up and he spoke these words on the floor of Congress. What any religious tradition describes as God's will is no concern of this Congress. We're begging for God's judgment. In April of 2021, editorial appeared in the Los Angeles Times. It was headlined, now notice this, Why America's Godlessness is Good News for the Nation. And part of it read this way, the organic secularization we are experiencing in the United States is a progressive force for good, one that's associated with improved human rights, more protections for planet Earth, an increased sociocultural propensity to make this life as fair and just as we can in the here and now, rather than in a heavenly reward that fewer and fewer of us believe in. That's where we are in America today. We are literally witnessing the dismantling of the Christian foundation of our society. The gravity of the situation was recently summed up beautifully by Albert Moeller, the president of Southern Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He said, we are witnesses to one of the most comprehensive and fast-paced moral revolutions ever experienced by humanity. The velocity and breadth of this revolution are breathtaking, and the consequences are incalculable. He goes on, this society is dismantling the very structures that have allowed for the enjoyment and preservation of human liberty and the respect for life. Well, our nation is going down very, very fast. Very fast. 
And the question is, what are we supposed to do about it? How should we respond to this situation? Well, one way that people are responding, that Christians are responding, even Christian leaders are responding, is simply to ignore it. Believe it or not, there are Christian spokesmen who say that we as Christians are to focus only on one thing, and that's evangelism, and they argue that the collapse of society is not our concern. I believe this is a very unbiblical attitude. We're called by Jesus to be salt and light of the world, and the only way we can fulfill that task is to take a stand for righteousness, as well as preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel should be number one. But we certainly should take a stand for righteousness. Other professing Christians have decided to embrace the decline of our society by getting in bed with it, by endorsing immorality in the name of tolerance and Christian love. After all, they say, who are we to judge, and shouldn't we make Christianity as user-friendly as possible, free of all condemnation? Let me give you an example of this fuzzy-headed type of thinking. One of the nation's best-known evangelical pastors recently said that he believes that Christian businesses should be forced under a penalty of law to offer their services for homosexual weddings. He explained his view by saying, Serving people we don't see eye to eye with is the essence of Christianity. Well, let me tell you something, folks, that is not the essence of Christianity. I mean, I could preach a whole sermon just on that one statement. I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous. But let me tell you just two re- reasons it's ridiculous. We have a constitution, and that constitution says that we have the free, um, uh, free exercise of religion. The free exercise of religion. Furthermore, let me tell you something else. Helping people commit sin is not the essence of Christianity. Another one of the best known pastors in America just this last week got up in the pulpit and said, I've been getting a question about whether Christians should go to same-sex weddings. He said, of course you should go, and not only should you go, but you should take a gift to celebrate something that is a violation of God's Word, something that is a stench in God's nostrils. We're to celebrate it? Sorry. We can be loving. We don't have to be you know, hitting them on the head with a Bible, but at the same time, we don't celebrate sin. There's a third way that people are responding to the deterioration of our society, and that is by taking a stand for righteousness. And a sterling example of this is probably the most hated Christian leader in America today, and that's Franklin Graham. Graham spits bullets. People keep saying, why can't you be like your father? Well, his father was an evangelist. He's not an evangelist. He's a prophet. He's a prophet of God. And he says it the way it is. Look what he has to say here. True followers of Jesus Christ whose salvation is based entirely upon God's Word cannot endorse same-sex marriage regardless of what our President, the Congress, the Supreme Court, the media, or the latest Gallup poll says about the matter. He continues, this moral issue has been settled by God Himself and is not subject to man-made revisions or modifications. In the end, I would rather be on the wrong side of public opinion than on the wrong side of Almighty God who established the standard of living for the world He created. Marriage is a biblically moral issue and not a political one. And then he concluded with these words, This debate is ultimately about something much more important than the question of same-sex marriage. It's about the authority of Scripture. There are many things in Scripture that Christians disagree on, but the Bible is crystal clear about the sanctity of life and marriage. It is also clear that homosexuality is spelled out as a sin. There are no ands, no ifs, no buts. Every time I speak of standing for righteousness, I think of this man who died just a week ago, Don Wellman, one of my heroes in the faith. He was the founder of the American Family Association, and just like a Dave Wilkerson, he began to speak out in the mid-1970s. Oh boy, did he speak out. He spoke out boldly. He was just the pastor of a tiny little church in Tupelo, Mississippi. Can you imagine? I imagine God looked around and, who can I, who can I have take a stand for righteousness? He probably called three or four. And they said, well, you know, Lord, I only have a church of 5,000. I, I can't influence the nation. I mean, come on. And, and, and excuse after excuse. He calls on this guy, a nobody in Tupelo, Mississippi. And he said, here my Lord, send me. You know what he did? He wrote a news release that he sent to the Memphis newspaper. And he said, I am fed up with the garbage on television. My children can't even find a program to watch anymore. This is 1974. And he said, what I'm going to do is I want to call the pastors of America to get up in their pulpits and denounce this 
the immorality, the blasphemy, the violence. And I want them to call their people to turn off their TV sets for an entire week. Just turn them off. Don't watch anything. And he said, must have been a slow day in the news because the next thing I knew, that was all over the news, all over America. And he, in a few weeks, decided to resign his pastorate and become head of a new organization called the American Family Association. And he began to fight for morality in America. I knew him personally, and he told me one time, he said, David, the, my greatest, he said, you don't believe this, but he said, my greatest cri cri critics are preachers. He said, they write me nasty letters all the time. He said, the, the, the usual letter I get is one like this. You are spinning your wheels and wasting your time. Think of it. You have been opposing the immorality in our nation for years, and it just keeps getting worse. You are not winning. And I said, well, Don, how do you respond to that? He said, I always respond the same way. God did not call me to win. He called me to stand. We will not win until Jesus returns. But in the meantime, we must stand. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, again, my friends, Matthew 5, Jesus said, we are to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we continue to live as if we were totally unaware of impending destruction. We continue to wallow in sinful rebellion against God. And He continues in His love and His mercy and His patience to warn us of impending destruction, continuing to call us to repentance through prophetic voices. Since the death of David Wilkerson in 2011, God has raised up prophetic voices whom He has mightily anointed. To let it, and, and I want to mention three in particular. I wrote a whole book about this, God's Prophetic Voices to America, in which I, I think I had a ten in there. But let me just mention three. One is Robert Jeffress, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas. He, <laughs> yeah, he has written a powerful indictment of our nation entitled Twilight's Last Gleaming. In this book he said, over the past 50 years, our Supreme Court has made four explosive decisions that have so weakened the moral and spiritual structure and foundation of our country that our inevitable collapse is certain. Right now, we're simply living between the time of the explosions that have weakened our foundation and the strong coming implosion. We had him speak at one of our conferences one time. He explained that. He said, you know, he said, when I became pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, he said, I became known as the man who blew up Central Dallas. He did. He decided to renew the, all the buildings of the church, and something like four city blocks were blown up. And on the day he blew them up, he had to push a red button. He was up on top of a building, and CNN, and Fox News, and ABC, and NBC were all there. And he got very nervous. He thought, what if I push that button and nothing happens? <laughs> so he pushed the button, and he heard pop. He thought, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then, all of a sudden, the buildings started coming down. That's what he's saying here. He is saying, right now we're simply between that time of the explosions that have weakened the basic foundation and the coming implosion. Well, that was written before the Supreme Court made the same-sex marriage decision. A second prophetic voice, Erwin Lutzer, pastor emeritus of the Moody Church in Chicago. In a recent sermon he said, the powers of America today have chosen a path of rejecting God in His ways. Federal courts have interpreted our Constitution as requiring that the Bible, prayer, religious discussion be removed from our classrooms, community buildings, and places of public gathering. Government officials and educators across the country are systematically eliminating any vestiges of God from society. Militant secularists will not be satisfied until God is expunged from every fact of American life. A third prophetic voice. David Jeremiah, pastor of Shadow Mountain Community Church in El Cajon, California. He has written a condemning review of our society that is titled, I Never Thought I'd See the Day. Here is one of his observations. When I look at the changes that have occurred in the land I love, and in the church I love even more, just in my lifetime, I have to pinch myself to see if it's a dream gone bad. The changes are coming so fast and so furiously. He said, the truth is we can echo the words of Pogo, in the old Walt Kelly comic strip, we have met the enemy and he is us. We have allowed the world to conform us to its image instead of allowing the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to transform us into the image of Christ. It is true that God in His grace and mercy gave us a temporary respite, a window of grace through the miraculous election of Donald Trump in 2016. And incidentally, 
I believe that the crucial factor in that election was Franklin Graham who went to every state capital in the United States and had a prayer crusade. Every state capital. And at each stop, every stop, he began with these same words. I have no hope in the Democratic Party and I have no hope in the Republican Party. Zero hope. God, our only hope is God. And then he prayed for this nation. Trump ran for president on a campaign slogan that said, Make America Great Again. My friends, I have news for you. There is no politician on earth who can make our nation great again as long as we continue in our outright rebellion against God and His Word. What we really need is a determination to make America godly again. And that's because our fundamental problem, listen to me carefully now, our fundamental problem is not political, it's not economic, it's not social, it's not racial. No. Our problems in all of those areas are simply manifestations of the fundamental problem. And that problem is systemic godlessness. Systemic godliness. Our nation, like Judah, has gone too far in its rejection of God. And I personally believe our wound has become incurable. We have become a pagan, secularized nation as reflected in a series of brutal political facts. For example, after eight years of the most ungodly administration in American history up to that time, President Obama left office in 2016 with a 60% approval rating. In 2016, our nation's future, the millennials, 18 to 29 years old, supported an out-and-out -out socialist, Bernie Sanders. And when he failed to get the nomination, they voted overwhelmingly for Clinton. And in 2020, they supported the same socialist again. Third, Obama's designated heir, Hillary Clinton received 3 million more votes than Trump. And in the presidential election of 2020, Biden received 7 million more votes than Trump. That's the paganization of American society. We are in the minority, folks, I'm telling you. In a recent Barna poll, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me show you how somber the religious facts are. 77% of Americans believe divorce is acceptable. This is a recent poll by the Barna. 77% of Americans believe divorce is acceptable. 71% believe sexual intercourse between unmarried adults is acceptable. 69% believe having a baby out of marriage is acceptable. 65% believe same-sex marriage is okay. 58% believe viewing pornography is acceptable. And then to the startling statistic I mentioned a few moments ago, this makes me weep. 56% of people who identify themselves as born-again Christians say Jesus sinned. That is the famine of the Word in our nation. That is the result of preachers getting up every Sunday morning and preaching pop psychology instead of preaching the Word of God. It's no wonder our nation is in the condition that it's in. My friends, we need to face up to the fact that we have lost the culture war. Humanism has triumphed. We are now a nation begging begging, begging God for destruction. I think Romans chapter 1 makes it clear that the fate of our nation is sealed. Romans 1 tells us that God responds to this kind of rebellion against how He responds to this kind of rebellion. This is very interesting. It says, God steps back, He lowers the hedge of protection, and He allows evil to multiply. It's kind of like He says, well, you want to live like a pig? Okay, I'll step back, I'll lower the hedge of protection, and I'll let evil multiply. And what happens then? A sexual revolution. Read it, Romans chapter 1, a sexual revolution. This occurred in the United States in the 1960s. Then it says, if the nation does not repent, God takes a second step back, lowers the hedge of protection, and what happens? A plague of homosexuality, which occurred in this nation in the 1980s and 90s. Then it says that if the nation does not repent, God takes a third step back, lowers the hedge of protection one last time, and at that point He turns the nation over to depraved minds. And that's where we are, folks. Again, every day I look at that news, I say, we can't get any worse. The next morning, it's worse. Because depraved minds are in charge of our nation today. And evidence that can be found in how this nation rejoiced over the same sex decision of the United States Supreme Court. I think God wept as we rejoiced. I have no doubt He must have been re rejoicing, I mean, uh, weeping as we rejoiced. And then this photograph, a sickening photograph 
Obama had the White House lit up in the colors of the sexual perversion movement on June the 26th, 2015. In my opinion, you can put the, on the tombstone of America, July the 4th, 1776 to June the 26th, 2015. We sealed the fate of America when the Supreme Court made that decision and we rejoiced over it. So the question is, is there any hope for America when you consider all this? Is there any hope? Well, first of all, let me point out that Europe is going the same way. I went to Europe in the year 2000, 24 years ago. I went and I spent a month preaching in Europe. I started in London and preached in all uh, churches around London. Then I went to the coast and preached at churches all along the uh, coastal channel. I went to Welsh, Wales and heard the most beautiful singing I've ever heard in my life. And then I went up to Scotland and preached at several churches there. I had no idea what the Scottish were saying, none whatsoever. I just... <laughs> They seemed to understand me, but I couldn't understand a word they said. And I went, I turned to my London host and I said, what are they saying? He said, I haven't got any idea what they're saying. <laughs> we then went over to Northern Ireland and we ended our tour there in Northern Ireland, which is part of, of, of England. And at that time, only 7% of the British were attending church. 7% in the year 2000. 7% attending church. It was a nation that was the center of Christianity in 1850, sending missionaries all over the world. Half the songs in our songbook written by Anglican priests. The day is just as pagan as it possibly be. In fact, they have a Hindu as their prime minister now. We're following the same path, right down the same path. When did it happen? It happened when the German School of Higher Criticism jumped across into England and hit the seminaries like an atomic bomb. And before long the seminaries were teaching, this is not the Word of God. This, uh, this is man's search for God and therefore it's full of myth, legend, and superstition and people stop going to church. Why well, go to church just to hear psychological sermons? We're on the same path. Christianity is dead right now. There's of course pockets of revival and pockets of churches that are on fire like this one, but overall it's dead. And all around the world we find Christians being persecuted horribly, horribly. Our world is a ticking time bomb. And one of the tragedies is that the average person is just going about his normal business as if nothing is wrong, totally oblivious to the fact that the wrath of God is about to be poured out. Is there any hope for our nation? My question is, how could there be? As Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, and he's one of the prophets God sent to America, he came to America, lived in America, and boy did he speak out about America. In 1983 he said, America has forgotten God. And that sums it all up. That's the problem with this nation. We have forgotten God. And we have forgotten His Word. But nevertheless, we should not despair for several reasons. First, what we are experiencing is a fulfillment of end time Bible prophecy, folks. The Bible Biblical prophets, including Jesus Himself, all prophesied that in the end time society would disintegrate into violence and immorality, that it would become as evil as the days of Noah, and that people would go about their business as if everything was normal. And that is exactly where we are today. And thus we are witnesses to the very signs that are heralding the soon return of Jesus. That's why the great pastor Adrian Rogers once said, the world is growing gloriously dark. Because it's an indication Jesus is about to return. It's the reason that Jan Markell says over and over, the world is not falling to pieces, rather the pieces are all falling into place. The second reason we should not despair is because there is individual hope. For those of us who are believers, God has promised that He will never forsake us. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble. For Yahweh your God is the one who goes before you. He will not fail you or forsake you. A third reason we should not despair is because of what God is doing in heaven right this moment. The Bible says in Psalm 2, I love this, that all the political leaders of the world are conspiring against Him. And what is He doing? He's sitting in the heavens laughing laughing. Not because he doesn't care, but because he has it all under control. Because he has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of Jesus Christ. And he's in the process of doing that. And also we should not despair because we have the glorious hope of the rapture of the church which could occur any moment. Any moment. Oh, what a day that will be. 
What a day that will be. There is also hope for unbelievers. As Robert Jeffers puts it, when the darkness deepens, the light of Jesus will shine more brightly like a diamond on a black cloth, and more and more people will be drawn to Jesus and be saved. That, of course, assumes there's somebody out there proclaiming Jesus, as this church is doing and as we are to do as individuals. I want to conclude by emphasizing once again, we are to stand for salt and light. We are to speak out against the evils of our society. I always told, used to tell people when I, years ago when I was on the radio, I said, there's so much evil in our land that you, you can't deal with all of it. Pray for God to lay a particular burden on your heart. Ask Him to do it. And He'll do it. It may be abortion. It may be people caught up in homosexuality. It may be the horrible spending of our nation and politicians that need to be prayed for. But pray that He'll leave a specific problem on your heart. Then, once He does it, do something about it. If it's abortion, write letters to the newspaper. Or go out and stand in front of an abortion clinic. Or put your arms around a young woman who is pregnant out of marriage and help her any way you can. Or adopt a child. It, do something about it. We must be beacons of hope, pointing people to the God of hope while urging them to put their hope in the only hope, which is Jesus Christ. And that's the reason every morning I get up, I cry out, Maranatha, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you.